All right. Um, welcome everyone. If I can just share my screen. Awesome. Um, welcome everyone to the 2021 Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission Annual Summit. Uh, my name is Julian Roby. I am the coordinator for the uh, P Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission, otherwise known as the PCARC. Uh, just going to do some housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, th as you all can see at the top of the screen, this meeting is being uh, recorded um, and we're going to post this uh, meeting um, on our web page for everyone to reference back to um, for, for, for the next year. Um, and it will also be a part of our uh, library. Um, I'll just go through um, our agenda. So we'll start with obviously the welcome, then um, we'll be having a statement, um, a PCR statement from our chair, Chair Travis Grundy. Um, then we'll go through our pro our process, um, and then we'll talk about our annual report, um, which is uh, details the data over the last year that the PCR has worked on. Then we'll have a presentation from the Citizens League on the St. Paul C Community First Public Safety Commission. Then we'll do a uh, question and answer panel. Um, and then Mayor Carter will give us some remarks and then we'll close out with some next steps and give you guys some information on future uh, meetings and events, um, as well as a special PSA from Hero. Um, just uh, for uh, so we can get through, we have a lot of information to get through over the uh, this event. So we wanna make sure that we hold all questions until the question and answer portion of the event. Um, if you do have a question that uh, you um, really, really want answered, I would suggest putting it in the chat. Um, yeah, um, so without further ado, ado um, I will turn it over to our chair, Chair Travis Grundy, who will do PCR introductions and our PCR statement. All right, so thank you so much to uh, start off. My name is Travis Grundy. I am the current chair of the PCR Commission and I represent Ward 7. And um, I will turn it. We'll just go down the line and everybody can introduce themselves. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Sierra Cumberland. I'm the current vice chair of the PCR, and I live in Ward 5 in the North End neighborhood. Hi, guys. This is Charles Deneen. Um, I'm a commissioner from Ward 4. And good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Forstrom. I'm a commissioner and I live in Ward 4 also. Hello, everyone. I am Commissioner Alex Halverson. I live in Ward 1 in the Summit University neighborhood. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stefan Landro Vellinga. I am a commissioner from Ward 2. And hi, everyone. I'm Jilla Nadimi, Commissioner and of Ward 4. Thank you, everybody. Um, and obviously, you know, Interim Director uh, Christian Butler, and who will be speaking with us a little bit later this evening, and Coordinator Ro uh, Julian Roby. Um, my statement tonight is going to be just a bit brief, and we'll get moving along. Uh, again, thank you. Greetings, friends and neighbors. This past year has been a series of trials and opportunities. Everyone has been forced to make changes in how they live, work, and experience the world around them. We, are, we have collectively come to a newer and deeper understanding of what it means to be an economically essential worker, the effort it takes to educate and raise children in a virtual environment, and what it means to be a person of color, and how fear and misunderstandings can deteriorate what should be simple police interactions. It is my belief that the St. Paul Police Department, like all organizations, has its struggles. It is also my belief that the department as a whole and frontline officers in particular are well-meaning and do all they can to serve the needs of the community every single day. Existing in a post-COVID-19, post-George Floyd world here in the Twin Cities, means that the Police Civilian Internal Affairs Review Commission is doubling down on its efforts to provide community insight, liability consideration, and officer wellness oversight 
into our review and case deliberations and our ongoing trainings. Being able to hear community concerns about officer interactions enables us to provide critical recommendations directly to SPPD. It is my hope that as members of the community, you will all take the time to let us know, let SPPD know what's working and what's not working. We ask a lot from our officers and I know that they can rise to any challenge. As we move uh, to finish out 2021 and move into 2022, I ask that you please remember to continue trusting us with your truth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Grundy. Um, so next we'll move into our PCR process. As you can see, here is a uh, layout of from complaint intake all the way to complaint closure. Um, and we'll just go through step, I'll go through step by step process and what um, that entails um, for from the PCR standpoint. So beginning with complaint um, intake and review. So complainants can submit uh, complaints in a variety of different methods. Um, they, we have an online complaint form. We also have numerous different uh, community intake centers, including the Neighborhood Justice Center, the District 2 Community Council, the West Side Community Organization, and the, the, the St. Paul NAACP um, office located at the Halle Q. Brown Center. Um, you can go to one of those community intake centers and they, they will have complaint forms for you that you can fill out and um, either you can mail them directly to us or they will mail them to us and we can pick them up. Um, you can also go online and print off a complaint form and mail it to us. You can come to our come to the hero office um, in City Hall and get a complaint form and fill it out and mail it to us. Um, one thing to note is that um, for a complaint to be considered complete, it must have a name and a signature um, with each complaint. Minnesota, under state law, Minnesota does not allow um, you to submit anonymous complaints. So once you've done that, you've submitted your complaint, it has a name and a signature, it's reviewed by myself. Um, and then that um, complaint form is then sent off to internal affairs for them to begin their investigation. In addition to that, you, uh, the complainant receives an intake letter from me notifying them that the complaint has been received and that, the um, that they will be followed up with from, from an investigator and someone from internal affairs during the investigation process. And it takes anywhere from about six to 10 weeks between the time that the complaint um, for between that complaint intake and that complaint is reviewed by the PCR. Um, so once that's completed, internal affairs conducts their investigation and that can do, be a lot of different things, including uh, get collecting witness statements, complainant statements, getting the officer statement, um, looking at a variety of different evidence, um, whether that's in car camera footage, body worn camera footage, um, it, uh, evidence from wherever the um, incident, uh, alleged incident took place, um, a variety of different things. And these, all this evidence is compiled into a case file, which is then loaded up onto a virtual desktop interface in which the P, uh, PCR um, will use utilize to review their complaint prepare for their review session um, later on during the pro during this process. So um, once uh, these complaint cases are finished, they're loaded up onto the virtual desktop interface and two weeks prior to the meeting, um, I receive an email from internal affairs and um, with a list of officers, uh, alleged officers and complainants. Um, and their uh, and I will then send them a letter notifying them that their complaint case is coming for before review before the commission. And this is the time and place in which the compl um, their complaint case will be reviewed and they have an opportunity to provide a statement to the commission should they so choose. In the event that they would not like to um, provide a statement, that is totally fine. This is an option. This is optional and their complaint case will still be reviewed. Um, however, we do like to extend that opportunity to them. Um, and this is in addition to that, I then notify the commissioners that on, on the VDI site, they have two weeks to review these complaint cases and come prepared for deliberations and recommendations on dispositions and then if necessary, disciplinary actions, um, recommendations to go forward to the chief. So two weeks pass by and then we come together and meet at um, our location for the um, for the PCR meeting. And these meetings take place all over this, uh, all across the city of St. Paul at various different libraries and rec centers. Um, and we do have two different portions of the meeting. We have a public portion for uh, updates, um, trainings, some tra some trainings, excuse me. 
um, as well as an opportunity for uh, community members to ask questions from the commissioners and even just just meet them and just get um, information and learn about what's going on um, both with the commission and as well as HERO and then even um, the police department. And then we have a private portion and that's where case review and deliberations take place. Uh, during once we go to the closed private portion, that is the opportunity that is the time in which the complainant may provide a, a voluntary statement. Um, in the event that the complainant decides to provide the statement, um, that statement is the complainant has 10 minutes to provide a statement before the commission. It's audio recorded. Um, once that's complete, uh, that case is then tabled for that meeting for it to be transcribed, and then it comes back to the commission for review. Um, the commission is not allowed to ask any questions. However, um, they are uh, they are there to intently listen and um, hear from the complainant firsthand in their own um, in their own words what their complaint is about. Um, in the event that it's, the complainant provides a statement, the officer is then allowed an opportunity to provide a statement. Um, and the officer again is voluntary; does not have to provide one. Um, and once that's done, that complaint say, again, that complaint case is then tabled for that meeting and allow for it to be transcribed and then add back into the case file and then the commission can review it. And that usually takes on average um, a month to two months before that complaint case is, comes back for review for the commission. In the event that no one, um, the complainant does not would not like to provide a statement, the commission then makes uh, reviews the complaint case um, and makes a recommendation. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, deliberates on what should happen for a disposition. Um, and we'll go through the different dispositions later on in the presentation, as well as, if necessary, uh, disciplinary action. At the, after the uh, commission has made their recommendation, I write up a recommendation memo that goes directly to the chief of police who has the final decision making power. In the event that the chief disagrees with the recommendation of the commission, the chief then notifies myself, who then notifies the chair, and they ha the chair has five business days to set us um, to set up a meeting with the chief in order to discuss why there is a disagreement between the chief and the and the commission. Um, once that has concluded, um, the uh, if discipline is imposed, the officer may go through a grievance process and appeal that decision. Um, once the complaint is completed, uh, the complainant no receives a letter notifying them um, if discipline was imposed, what that discipline was. If no discipline is imposed, that their complaint case is notified. We then track um, all this information and we um, include that in our annual, both our recommendations as well as how many times the chief disagreed in our annual report, which I'll go through next. So the 2020 annual report. So. Uh, the PCRC reviewed 39 cases um, involving 81 officers with 47 total um, allegations and 90 total allegations. And uh, why there is a difference between allegations and total allegations is because the way in which um, we review cases, they can have a they can have one complaint case can have numerous different allegations within it, but it would only be categorized as a single allegation. For instance, you have officer X and Y. Um, and officer X and Y are both being looked um, being alleged to have improper procedure, but officer X also has improper conduct um, as well for this complaint case. In that event, it would be it would classify under two allegations, um, but total allegations would be three. So that's why there's that little that's why there's that discrepancy between allegations and total allegations. Um, so for 2020, um, the total complaint classic um, complaint uh, classifications for excessive force was um, there's one excessive force case complaint case reviewed, uh, one for discrimination, 31 improper procedures, uh, five improper conducts, 10 poor public relations, and there was one firearm discharge. In the next slide, we're going to go into dispositions. Uh, firearm discharge has a different set of dispositions, which I'll go through a little bit later. So it's not going to fall under this next set as next this these next few uh, slides. So the dispositions, this is what the commission um, during the deliberations um, will make a case for what they think that the complaint case uh, should fall under. Unfounded allegation is false or not factual exonerated, incident complained of occurred but was lawful and proper, not sustained, insufficient evidence either to prove or disprove the allegation, sustained, the allegation is supported by sufficient evidence, policy failure, the allegation is factual, the officer filed proper departmental procedures which have proven to be faulty in no action. This results in a tie, this is the resulting um, becoming of a tie voting which the commission could not come into cannot determine um, a disposition and it goes action. Go, the complaint case goes directly to the chief from internal affairs instead of with a recommendation from the commission. 
Based on the um, complaint cases that the commission reviewed in 2020, the they voted, um, they determined 22 um, complaint cases to be unfounded, 37 um, exonerated, not sustained to be nine times, sustained 19 times, policy failure, policy failure two times, and uh, no action resulting in tie vote two times. And in the event that a complaint is sustained, we will then go into a discipline. That's when the commission will recommend discipline that should be imposed with the um, complaint case. Uh, back to the firearm case data. So again, there's the dispositions available are either justified or not justified. There was only one firearm case um, that the commission reviewed in 2020, and they determined it to be not justified. And we also classify what kind of firearm um, who was involved, and it was human, um, and it was accidental as well. Um, the disciplinary uh, recommendations from the commission. So uh, again, point of clarity here, uh, retraining does not fall under a uh, technical disciplinary action. It must be coupled with um, one of the other disciplinary actions, including supervisory counsel or reprimand, written reprimand, suspension or and a termination. Um, in 2020, the commission recommended supervisory counsel three times or reprimand five times written reprimand seven times, retraining was coupled with those recommendations 13 times, suspension five times, and zero um, times was termination, termination recommended. Uh, the chief disagreed with the PCR 10 times over the course of 2020. We also keep track of our um, some of our demographic information um, for the complaint cases that come in through our office. So oftentimes we will have, um, a, and this kind of helps inform our outreach and engagement strategies, um, inform some of our other programming where we need to really focus our efforts to make sure that we're reaching um, underrepresented groups. So uh, we, we found that majority of our um, complaints last year were, uh, either, were um, fema um, female. Um, we also, uh, at 35%, um, it's, sorry. Uh, yep, at and male for um sorry female at forty five percent male at thirty five percent and then no answer for twenty percent so sometimes people um don't include um where they identify that also is can be the same case for race and, and, and ethnicity um our m most prominent um, racial group was African American Black um then um, white or Caucasian um a uh, Asian and then two or more races uh. Um, as well as other at two. And then we also had a numerous people that submitted no answer for um, their racial group. We also track it for income and age and disability, disability status. Um, again, here's a breakdown of um, income. We found that majority of the uh, majority of people didn't answer for income. Um, and then it was evenly distributed across for the other uh, less than 20,000, 20 to 35,000, 50 to 75,000, 75,000 to 90,000, 100,000. Uh, age. So for our largest group reported was 35 to 54. Um, second was 26 to 34. Um, 55 to 64, we had one person and then four, um, no answer for the remaining. Uh, one thing we wanted to also um, bring light to with this demographic information, this kind of informed one of our uh, other events we had earlier this year, our youth summit. Um, we really wanted to um, engage better with our youth and find out why we're not seeing any complaints. So we're hope um, the the hope um, from that turnout from that event is that we will start to see more engagement um, from our youth in this process. Finally, uh, disab disability status. Um, we had um, other non-disclosed disability status, um, not blind or uh, blind, low vision or deaf or heart, hearing impaired um, as the most uh, prominent disability status for those that filed a complaint. Majority of people um, did not um, answer the, uh, the, to this survey. With that, that concludes our um, annual report. We will now turn it over to the Citizens League uh, St. Paul Community First Public Safety Commission. And I'm going to stop sharing and go to our other prep PowerPoint. Give me one second.
Thanks so much, Julian. Uh, real quick, while you're pulling up that PowerPoint, I wanted to highlight the accessibility of the complaint filing. So as Julian mentioned, um, folks, um, internal affairs can't investigate a complaint unless it's filed. Um, however, witnesses, friends, neighbors can file a complaint. They don't have to be the person that actively experienced the misconduct. Um, I also want to highlight that um, accommodations and accessibility options are available when filing complaints. So we've got our forms in multiple languages and the city of St. Paul is also able to provide language assistance for those who are part of the deaf and hard of hearing community or folks with limited English proficiency. So I just wanted to highlight the accessibility of those options as well. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Kate Semino and I serve as Executive Director of the Citizens League. I'm here with my colleague Amanda Kunjbahari and we are pleased to be with you and presenting the results of the Community First Public Safety Commission. Julian, thank you for bringing up the slides. Um, I wonder if it's showing as like a half on the screen. I wonder if there's a different way to do presentation. Well, I can get started while we're messing around with that. Um, How about now? Yeah, it's showing the same. Hmm. Is it doing slideshow from beginning? Like if you click on slideshow. Coordinator Roby, at, at the top right in between animations and a review, it says slideshow. Try clicking there and yeah, from the beginning and see if that works. It didn't. Hmm. That's weird. Well, the other thing that might work is if you grab that horizontal bar in the middle and pull it, drag it down, it might just increase the size of the um, slide that, yeah, right there. It might, hey, there we go. All right, that'll work. Good. I got a thumbs up from Sierra. Thank you. Well, good. Again, thank you for the invitation to be with you tonight. We will buzz through our slide deck and share a little bit about this process and the outcomes and uh, will be available for questions. The other thing I'll tell you, if you haven't found it yet, there's a giant report that we have living on our website and the Citizens League site that encompasses every single thing you would ever wanna know about this process and the outcomes. And so if you're curious about anything here or just some more context about the project, about the outcomes, I encourage you to check that out. There's a lot more there um, that you could dig into. So very good, uh, next slide, please. The Citizens League, many of you may know, has been a part of Minnesota for nearly 70 years. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. I like to say we're multipartisan because we bring together people and viewpoints from a lot of different perspectives and ideologies. We work to craft really meaningful solutions to Minnesota's policy challenges and community challenges and have been known um, for our work in a lot of different policy areas over the years. Next slide, please. So the Community First Public Safety Initiative and our framework is a larger effort that Mayor Carter has designed for the city of St. Paul. So you may have heard about and been following along with that framework. This commission is but one part of that uh, larger effort. So this commission was convened in December of 2020 and uh, the charge was as shown here in three parts. The first was to develop alternative first response options to priority four and five calls for service. The next was to recommend approaches for ongoing community involvement in the larger community first public safety framework. And the third was to consider the creation of what you may know as an office of violence prevention, as it's called in many other cities and jurisdictions, we've been calling it an office of neighborhood safety. It would be a city staffed office that would be driving and integrating some of these preventive and uh, neighborhood based strategies. So we're gonna, uh, as we walk through here, we're gonna share the outcomes for that first bullet, and then the second two are going to come to you as a kind of a set. All right, next slide, please. Our project team, we had amazing co-chairs that were also participants on the commission, Akua Ellis and John Marshall. They were fantastic to work with. 
our Citizens League team, as we were engaged by the city of St. Paul, contracted to be the neutral convener of this process and to design a process that the folks on this commission would go through, as well as the community engagement pieces. That was myself, Amanda, and our colleague Jacob, predominantly from the Citizens League, and we had a few additional researchers and project assistants as well. Next slide. This is a hilariously giant list on a really small slide. I don't expect that you'll be reading all these names right now. You can certainly check out the full list of commissioners on our website. But I share this just to underscore that it was a big group of people. It was a lot of people. 48 people were named to the commission by the mayor's office. They represented a lot of different various sectors. So we had law enforcement, we had education, we had youth faith communities, cultural and other affinity groups. We had philanthropy, we had advocacy, we had intergovernmental partners and some at-large members who represented, um, represented different parts of St. Paul. So one thing I'll underscore here is that folks were not just showing up to this commission with just their title or their affiliation. We really encourage participants to bring their whole self, bring their multiple identities in their neighborhood, their community, their work, family and share that and name it because that was part of this process. It was an important part of honoring the multiple identities we all share and the ways that we move in the world. And I believe it really enhanced our process, which is as follows. So we held 10 three hour meetings over Zoom video. So that's a total of 30 hours. That is not a lot of time. It's less than one full work week. If you think of it that way, that was the time that the full commission had together on Zoom. So the, the meetings were about every other week from December 2020 through April 2021. Meetings were available live stream to the public on YouTube. We didn't capture audio record or we didn't capture video recordings. We just created minutes from some audio recordings and then deleted them. The graphic that you see here shows what we think of as the Citizens League's study committee process, which we applied here. And that the notable thing about this is that that first half really is the learning and discovery phase that we all do together. Let's not jump to recommendations until we've all gone through together a process of understanding the challenges, understanding the opportunities, hearing stories, and then we'll move into the next phases. And that worked really well. We spent a lot of time in that first half because there was a lot to wrap our heads around. The other um, takeaway from this phased approach is that when you see the recommendations that came out of this process, which Amanda will share momentarily, it's important to know that wasn't just a survey we threw out to the group on the first day. That was the result of many months of work that they did together. And the ideas that they were weighing in on that you'll see as the recommendations that emerged, those ideas were ideas that they generated. So we learned, they generated in phase two and phase three, and then they voted on and weighed in on this in the survey, those recommendations at the end. And next slide, please. Um, okay. So here we'll share a little bit about the priority four and five calls. Initially, this sounded pretty simple. It was okay, these are non-urgent, non-violent. They might be quality of life calls. They might be uh, a report of a crime that occurred more than 20 minutes ago, maybe any suspect is no longer on scene, that type of thing. As we started digging deeper though, it became really complex to wrap our heads around this. And the reason is because these situations are very dynamic. We all know they can change, they can escalate, they can shift, new folks can be involved. It, there's always more to it than meets the eye. And the designation of a priority four and five only refers to the order that that call is ranked as it's dispatched out to responders. It doesn't indicate the outcome. It doesn't indicate um, what will occur toward the end of that call or throughout or um, a lot of other things that can emerge as we go. So what we did is we took a look at all the different situations that could be in a priority four and five. There were nearly 50, five zero, 50 different call types that Ramsey County Emergency Communications Center and SPPD would have in those categories. So it got, it got really, really thick <laughs> to move through that and to really hone in on what recommendations the commission wanted to develop. 
we had the commission do some work on identifying within those 50 different situations in four and fives, what do they really want to focus on? What do they think they could have the greatest impact? And they did some work on that and ended up with the next slide. Call types that they identified as of highest interest and greatest interest to the commission. So you'll see here. Many of these situations, such as a disorderly conduct situation or a child abuse situation, those can and are showing up in higher priority levels. This was, okay, when those are in a non-urgent, non-violent type of scenario, what could an alternative response be? In our report, we've got tons more on these different call types, so feel free to just really dig in. I think this is a group that would, <laughs> would enjoy doing that to really look into what we learned, what we talked about, some of the concerns, considerations that members talked about during this process. But as, we, um, as I turn it over to Amanda, what you'll see here is that the recommendations that emerged were grouped into these categories just as a way of thinking about these situations as a way of organizing our thinking. So you'll see these are used as kind of buckets or categories of recommendations that emerged. And I will turn it over to Amanda. Thank you, Kate. It would be helpful if I unmuted, wouldn't it? Um, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having Kate and myself. As Kate mentioned, my name is Amanda Kunchbahari. I'm the Director of Public Policy with the Citizens League. Um, before I dive in, I wanna just give a shout out to Sierra Cumberland for your work on the commission, serving as a commission member. Um, so just really appreciate it. And thank you for having us here too. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Wonderful. So Kate kind of referenced this. Um, on the slide here, this is the recommendation, the final recommendation survey that we ended up um, sending to the commission kind of at the end of this process. And as Kate mentioned, this wasn't just kind of the last survey. It really was a buildup of a five month process to get to this point. And we wanted to make sure we designed something that not just asked people about you know, what they support, but we wanted to get to the immediacy of how they would prioritize that recommendation. And then uh, Kate kind of referenced um, we an image on slide seven that the goals that the commission came up with, um, we call it the flower graphic that you saw. It's a really pretty image. And that is really the last question, question C. Um, we wanted to understand how well do the ideas that were coming up, how well do they align with the goals that the commission themselves identified? So we thought that that was important. Um, and so this is, again, a snapshot of what we asked folks. And we asked people to answer these questions for each recommendation that surfaced from the commission. And so they had a chance to vote on each thing that was coming up. If we could go to the next slide, please. All right. So this slide and the next one that you'll see are the top recommendations. Again, you'll see here those eight different call type categories. Um, there's four on the screen and you'll see the other four on the next screen. Um, but before we move to the next slide, I wanna just highlight that we had to kind of um, determine a threshold to talk about these recommendations. So in the report, you will see all of the recommendations that surfaced, but we really wanted to highlight these ones and as you see on your screen, these recommendations had 90% or more support. So that was, again, question A, where people answered whether or not they support this recommendation. And then it was also overlaid with a rating of 50% or more um, immediate implementation. So again, these are the top recommendations that folks supported and thought should be immediately implemented. And immediacy really was looking at the city's 2022 budget. So people really want to see these things happen um, pretty soon. And another thing to note, you can read these recommendations as they are either a desired skill or behavior of the first responder themselves or a resource that would be helpful in achieving um, better outcomes for the caller, community members and or responders. Um, a couple of things that I want to note, and we can go to the next slide too, so folks can see those uh, recommendations. So two things to note, um, 
we know that these recommendations are pretty high level. We really do encourage you if you have a chance and have time to go through the final report. Um, I did drop the link in the chat so you can find it there. And it gets into a little bit more of the nuanced details about the process and um, comments that the commissioners themselves submitted that I think add some context to some of these recommendations. And we also do want to note, um, I think one thing that we learned through this process is that the city and county are doing a lot of different things that are um, related to these recommendations, if not what these recommendations are noting. So some of that is captured in the final report, but we know that the city and county um, are talking about that and are really intrigued and interested in how to build on what they're already doing and also be innovative um, and, and implementing some of these things as well. So if we could go to the next slide. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so Kate mentioned, so what I just went through was the first part of the charge. And this second, the slide here that you're seeing in front of you, uh, we were lucky to collaborate with the Harvard Kennedy School's Government Performance Lab. So they came in on the project and they really focused on these two charges that you see here on your screen. So first one, as Kate mentioned, uh, consider the creation of an Office of Neighborhood Safety, again, also called Office of Violence Prevention sometimes. And then the second charge was to figure out, you know, how do we continue to do ongoing community engagement and involvement in an office like this and in uh, the, the mayor's work around community first public safety initiatives. And through this, I do want to highlight that um, Harvard GPL did look at, they did a scan of 17 other jurisdictions. So some of that is included in their final report as well, which is embedded in the overall report. And they really pulled what they learned into a final survey that they sent to the commission members and really surveying what they thought about this idea and some other important pieces with it. So if we could go to the next slide, you will see what those recommendations are. So again, there's more detailed in the final report about this. Um, a couple of things to highlight and note. So 95% of commissioners recommended the creation of a city staffed office of violence prevention. So um, there was huge, huge support there. And we thought that that was something that was really noteworthy. Um, you can see some of the areas of focus that folks were most interested in. And another piece too, in terms of community participation, uh, people really wanna see that community members are being hired to staff the office, to be a part of it, and to really be leading this work, especially those who've been impacted by violence. Um, so folks with lived experience and really wanting to see community governance happening where community members are involved in the strategic planning process and that there are really um, intentional ways to engage with the community on this. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Perfect. So this is my last slide. Um, and we thought it was important to really kind of ground this work in the current moment of what was happening during this time. So a couple of things that we um, really had to grapple with while, you know, hosting this commission and going through this process and that commissioners really had to deal with um, was the current moment. So the first thing, first and foremost, is that the COVID-19 pandemic really did uh, push us to have to do everything via Zoom. So that was a challenge in and of itself, is just having 40 folks convening them in a virtual environment and still finding ways to build relationships and to um, you know create that space for people to get to know one another and to build trust especially with the subject matter that we were talking about. And we do think there were ways that that did happen. So um, we are definitely pleased that folks were able to form some really strong relationships through this work. Um, another piece, just the kind of current environment. So as we all know, um, there was a lot that happened in the past few months while this commission was going. Specifically, there was a lot of tension around community and law enforcement and just acknowledging that the um, officer involved related 
incidents and deaths that occurred uh, specifically with Dalal Eid, um, Dante Wright, and we also experienced the loss of Desandria Wallace and her children um, in St. Paul during this time. And we also had the trial of Derek Chauvin happening. So we just put that in context that I think everybody on the commission, and I'm sure um, Sierra can speak to this as well, that that weight was not lost on anyone. And it was something that we um, talked about. I had to make sure that we were setting up these commission meetings to really um, provide space for people to have some community, to have mindfulness moments, and to really just acknowledge what was happening during this time and how applicable and relevant all of it was to the work that was happening here. Um, I just wanna note the commission's scope. We mentioned the three charges that we had and just wanted to highlight that they were large and they were nuanced and um, just the reality was we didn't have enough time to get into all of the nuance and complexities, which is why, um, as I mentioned earlier, some of the recommendations are just at a higher level. We do hope that that leaves room though for city and county and community to really um, build out what those strategies will look like and how they will be operationalized. And then to end this presentation on, um, I think a really positive note too, is that we heard many, many times through this process that the commission members themselves are very interested in this work and extremely committed to it. And so there are just a ton of people who participated on the commission and or who attended town halls that we hosted that are interested and ready and willing to engage in this work and to move things forward. Um, so I will now turn it to open it up to questions um, that Kate and I are happy to take. And please reach out to us with any questions that you may have as well. Uh, again, thank you uh, both uh, both of you for that. And I, I know that we had a couple of questions that came through in the chat. Um, I had actually asked um, what structural violence was. I, I think that's one one of the things when we get very high level that sometimes are not super clear, especially when we're we're trying to explain it to maybe a very general uh, um, uh, audience. Um, are, are there any other areas like structural violence that you know were high level that may not be immediately clear? to say, you know, the average, um, the average community member? Sure, and Travis, thanks for that question. And I'm glad we get to have that little exchange in the chat. The focus areas that were discussed and voted upon for the Office of Neighborhood Safety, a lot of them do need further definition. And if you'd like, I can actually share my screen momentarily here. Um, can you all see that? Yes, can we can. The appendix. Um, so this is this is page eighty three of our four hundred and nineteen page report. Uh, most of <laughs> much of which is documentation to create some transparency around uh, this process. This is the appendix of the Office of Neighborhood Safety segment, and you can see here these focus area descriptions. Um, I think one that we talked about a lot in the process was this group-based violence. I don't know if you can see me highlighting this. Many people were casually using the term gang violence and based on their national scan of Office of Violence Prevention or Neighborhood Safety, the Harvard GPL group recommended the definition here of group-based violence, which has to do more with mediating conflict between groups uh, and providing exit or alternatives in the form of services. A little bit of a different and bro perhaps broader definition beyond just something one might call gang violence. And so this is just an example of how a lot of these terms do need more definition. And we've tried to provide as much transparency as we can um, in our report. It it uh, sounded to me kind of like you're really trying to give the widest possible opportunity to you know allow organizations to really define what it looks like for St. Paul specifically, but also kind of providing a, a framework that could be adapted to other cities. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, Amanda, do you want to say a little bit more about that and how GPL navigated that? Yeah, and Travis, I'm not sure if the question is um, just specific to the OVP concept, but 
I'll just address it in terms of the overall report, um, because I think that question and the answer are, are applicable to both. So yes, um, while this is specific to St. Paul, the mayor, Car mayor Carter you right, uh, commissioned us to do this work. We just had a presentation with Ramsey County's board today, and um, I think they are really interested in looking at how can this be translated and incorporated, not just for the city of St. Paul, but for Ramsey County. So I think it's really promising, and I think folks um, really want to see this work kind of more broadly incorporated. And so that was really um, great to hear that. And so hopefully that answers your question that I think they're really looking at how can they utilize this work to also change things in all of the different parts of Ramsey County as well. There was also acknowledgement, if I could add to that, there was really acknowledgement throughout this process that the city of St. Paul and Ramsey County are already doing some really great practices and using great models that arguably are nation leading in alternative response and in police response and in mental health. And so there was acknowledgement of that and acknowledgement that more can always be done and alternatives still need to be sought for a lot of the things that we have always taken for granted as the default response. The, there was also acknowledgement that while we did a national scan of alternative response models, we did a national scan of Office of Violence Prevention models, you really do need to make it specific to St. Paul and make it specific to Ramsey County. It has to be, I think the word is bespoke, you know, created just for this city and this region because it is, every city is different. Every county is unique. And folks really like that idea of it has to be something special. Just whatever happens has to be right for St. Paul and for Ramsey County. Thank you, Kate and Amanda. Are there any other questions from any of the commissioners or any anybody from the public? for either Kate or Amanda. Hi everyone, this is Sierra here. Um, I just want to quick highlight how crucial the connection between the PCR, the city, the community, and the Community First Public Safety Commission are. Um, we've all got a lot of the same mutual goals of having St. Paul a better and safer place uh, for families to live and of a place of pulling together. So with the the three charges of this commission, um, it was incredibly complex work, but a, a really great feeling to be part of this space with folks that were willing to, you know, set their biases and their emotions aside and, and work together to come up with solutions. I think that the PCR with our goal of increasing transparency and accountability within the police department and also um, growing fealty of the systems of government to the community share a lot in common with the with the community first public safety commission so i just wanted to highlight that we've got a lot of mutual goals here and that um the work is very much far from over these are really just the first steps and i really hope that the pcr can continue continue to be engaged in the community first public safety framework with the city overall um, so that way we can continue to pull together, continue to collaborate those solutions. And I just wanted to say thank you too to Amanda and Kate for all of your time and efforts with this incredible report, but with also the ability to distill 419 some pages into 15 minutes. So that is very <laughs> impressive. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Sierra. And it was a, really a pleasure to work with you on this commission. It was the first time we had had a chance to meet and uh, work together and you contributed greatly to the work of this commission, so thank you. Awesome. Well, don't hesitate to reach out to us, everyone, if uh, follow-up questions arise. Amanda put the link to our website there. You can find our contact information there as well, and uh, we'll be happy to be of service in any way uh, that we can be helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move forward to our uh, question and answer portion of the uh, event. Um, I see that we have a question in the chat regarding um, some of the data. Um, uh, DB has asked earlier in this meeting, it was mentioned that the chief disagreed with the commission's recommendation 10 times in 2020, specifically what happened in each of those 10 cases. How was each case resolved? Um, so, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the commission does provide recommendations and the chief does have the final say in what should happen in 
each complaint case. Um, however, we are only allowed to release summary data, so we can't talk about specifics in each complaint case. Um, dealing that that data is um, employee data, and we can't share that um, because we're subject to uh, data um, data practices and data privacy laws. Um, so un unfortunately, that's all I can really give you to, to that question. Um, I think there were were there other uh, questions in the chat that I might have missed. I think there is an older question from DV as well. Um, and but I believe yeah. DV Before asked. Before we move on to the next one, if I may, I just want to elaborate a little bit on that process and what that looks like. Um, I served as chair of the commission previously during most of 2020. And yeah, we, we can't talk about specific cases, but just to elaborate a little bit more on the process of when the current chair of the PCR receives a complaint letter, we then have five days, and this is laid out in the ordinance as well, to communicate with the chief of police and have a more thorough discussion of why it is that the PCR came to the recommendations that were sent to the chief's office, as well as, um, so yeah, what the recommendations were, why we felt they were so important, as well as to get some understanding from the chief's perspective, perspective as well. We are civilians. Uh, we are proud and glad to be residents of our St. Paul community here. We are not members of law enforcement. We do not have the same amount of training, and we also don't have insight into the um, the employee and personnel matters that happen behind closed doors. Um, so while we are active in like the oversight community, and while we are making these individualized recommendations, it's important for us to also remember that these are each individual personnel and, and HR sort of matters. So um, sometimes we have also gotten an opinion from a member of the city attorney's office to provide a little bit more clarification on why it is that the chief came up, came to this decision. And um, but it is it is per Minnesota state law that the chief of police has final determination with these matters. So we do our best as a civilian board to communicate our thoughts and communicate where in policy we found violation um, and, and have that relationship with the chief of police. I do also want to to designate or to highlight that. So the chief of police, when he disagrees with a decision or a recommendation forwarded by the PCR, you know, it could be we found it sustained and the chief w thought it should be exonerated. Or it could be that the PCR found a complaint exonerated or unsustained and the chief determined, yes, this should have been a sustained complaint. So I just want to highlight that it's, it's a pretty complex process um, and that these decisions, when they're made by the PCR, as well as by the St. Paul Chief of Police, are not ones that are taken lightly. Um, there's really a lot of work that goes into these recommendations, as well as the final determinations by the chief. Uh, Commander Spears, would you like to speak any more on this particular subject? Yeah, thank you, Travis. Um, I did, I'd echo what Sierra just mentioned, especially that, you know, those cases, a lot of times there may be an assumption that the chief disagreed because, he, you know, he wants to go with exonerated or a lower discipline. But those cases can also involve situations where the chief may believe that, like Sierra said, a finding of sustained is more appropriate or that he believes there should be a higher level of discipline than what was recommended. Um, so there are a wide range of things covered. And uh, as was already mentioned, we do also rely on advice um, from the city attorney's office in certain cases. If it's a legal issue that we need to be mindful of constitutional law issues, we may ask them for advice. So it, it does cover a wide variety of situations, but I think you guys answered it uh, perfectly. Thank you. Are, are there more questions um, from the community? Um, any Anyone from the community, feel free to either unmute yourself and uh, or raise your hand um, or in, include your question uh, in the chat section. So there was an earlier, I guess it wasn't a question from DB, but a comment that um, regarding one complaint that took 14 months for a complaint to process. And I believe earlier in his presentation, coordinator Roby had mentioned a processing time of about six weeks. And so um, 
also wanted to call back to the fact that this this is indeed a pretty complex process and the six weeks um, that Julian had mentioned previously referred to the time that a complaint was received or was filed, investigated by internal affairs, and then got to the PCR. But um, it's an average, it's an estimate. There's a lot of investigative work that goes into these reports before the PCR sees them. And um, our folks at internal affairs sometimes have to go back and look for additional evidence. Also want to highlight that at the PCR, we have the ability to subpoena folks, subpoena um, witnesses, and we also have the ability to request further inf information, as well as request that the city hire an independent contractor, an independent investigator to look into certain cases as needed. Yeah, and I would just want to add to that for, for clarification, you know, the on occasion, you know, we will send a, a case back for additional review. Uh, and that, you know, it, that can definitely add a month or two to any kind of that process. And when you're seeing that, you know, notification of how a case has been disposed of and, and moved forward in the process, that's after everything in that process has been done, including any personal actions. Um, and, and so, you know, that that can take some time depending on um, the particularities of that particular case. Uh, I, and I do see that there's another question from uh, Miss Mary Cardinal. Uh, does the PCR review 100% of all uh, the complaints? And if not, what percent are reviewed? And why would some complaints not be reviewed? Um, the uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, in that every case that comes by us that's a complaint um, that's qualified, we we do review it. No, in that you know sometimes the complaint is fairly easily solved because they're just they want some immediate feedback they want to essentially say hey this occurred and, and, and it's really more important for me that you know uh, a sergeant uh, or commander discuss that with their subordinates than it is for them to really go through the entire investigative process and that's an example of a complaint that would come that we would not um, necessarily review another situation is you know if we get a complaint and there are significant legal considerations um, or the city attorneys determined that they're going to move forward with you know uh, any kind of uh, uh, litigation either against an individual or against an officer those would not come to us because that would go through a, a, a legal process um, but everything else that definitely comes towards us yeah so as as julian mentioned earlier um under Minnesota state law for a complaint to be investigated in this manner and go through this process, it has to be signed. So if um, if a complaint is not signed, internal affairs can't investigate, unfortunately. And uh, there are some complaints that are filed that get received by uh, the St. Paul Police Department that don't come to PC ARC. Um, some of the situations that Travis mentioned, but there have also been instances where it is a member of, say, the Maplewood Police Department, um, but it's a St. Paul resident that filed the complaint to the St. Paul Police Department. But if it's a Maplewood officer, our internal affairs department isn't able to investigate that case, isn't able to, you know, implement disciplinary recommendations there. So um, I also want to take this opportunity to encourage folks to file complaints. If you witness, if you experience police misconduct, it can't be addressed unless leadership is aware of it. So that is where we really and truly rely on the community. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it, it can be someone that witnessed misconduct. It can be a parent. It can be a friend. It can be anybody that has knowledge of this incident and is able to give us specifics of the when, the where, the what, and the why um, the of the complaint. I think that's and all I you know, a lot of people sometimes have concerns about filing a complaint directly with SPPD. Uh, again, the SPD has an, a method uh, for accepting those complaints. Complaints can be filed um, directly with HERO. Uh, I believe community partners, including the NAACP, can also accept complaints. You know, so if you are unsure where to file, you know, ask. And, you know, uh, uh, chances are that a community partner um, that you trust, that you feel comfortable with, is ready and available to help you with that complaint. Good evening, uh, Chair Grundy. If you don't mind, I wanted to jump in quickly at the end of that presentation. Thank you both very much. 
Uh, once again, my name is Christian Butler. I am the current director of St. Paul Hero. I just wanted to add to that that because since I've been in this role, I've already experienced that a number of people, they believe in order to file a complaint, something extreme needs to have happened, such as, you know, excessive force, things of that nature. And obviously, while those things would most definitely fall within the realm of filing complaints, um, it can be something as simple as you or someone you um, know or saw or overheard have a conversation with a police officer and you felt that the officer dismissed you, disregarded you, was disrespectful to you and his or her tone, something as simple as that would suffice with respect to a complaint. Of course, just like any other complaints, it would go through the um, formal complaint process, but I just wanted to note because some people, like I said, they don't real, they think it has to be at a certain level to qualify to file a complaint, and that is not the reality. So I just wanted to jump in quickly to add that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Director. Uh, Director. Director. Okay. Um, Butler. Uh, there, there's a few more questions that came in and, and they relate directly to uh, you know, transparency of the PCRC meetings, notification of PCRC meetings um, and kind of you know, communication overall of when those meetings are and you know, when a, a case is being uh, deliberated, uh, an individual having opportunity to communicate um, you know, their truth of the, of the situation. Um, I, I would like to ask um, either a, a Director Butler or one of the commissioners, if you'd like to take a stab at that um, and then um, have Coordinator Roby finish out by providing some more um, facts on those questions. At, at personally, at this point, Chair, I would defer to one of the commissioners because I think it would be most appropriate um, for the uh, attendees to hear from you guys as the representative um, the representatives of PC arc. Of course, I'm here to jump in if necessary, but I would defer to a commissioner who would like to um, tackle that. Thanks. Yeah, I see that Jilla put some information into the chat. Jilla, perhaps would you be willing to hop on and expand a little bit um, more about how we hold our meetings and how folks are notified? Sure. Hi, I'm Jilla. I posted in the chat where we um, we make it publicly known when our meetings are, including even this annual summit is on there. Uh, most of our meetings are held in person. Well, all of our meetings are held in person. We have a public portion and a private portion, which are closed doors where we deliberate. That's not open to the public. But in the public portion, we have a hero update. We have the um, uh, sometimes we have the you know senior. Sergeant Commander give updates on the St. Paul Police Department on events or any policy changes or anything that the public shouldn't be known of. And then when we go to the closed door, that's when we talk about individual cases. Since it is personnel matter, we we don't hold those open to the public. Um, and then uh, like this annual summit, which is online right now, that was also posted on our website. We could always have more improvement, I think, of letting the public know that we even have a website. So thanks for drawing your um, this as you know, putting spotlight and attention that we could do better job advertising that we do have a public portion to our meetings, and um, we're always looking for ways that we could improve the public portion meetings. There are times where it's really short and we wish we could have more engagement with the public. Um, and we also hold some more in formalized engagement matters like the youth summit and like this annual summit. And then we have a limited proficiency summit happening later this year um, that is open to more discussion and just learning more about what we can do for engagement in that sense. But we're always looking for ways that we can improve spreading the word. Um, and you know, increase our communication and presence in the community because that also helps us get commissioners on our board. And we're always looking for commissioners. So, if you're interested, check out that website link. Um, it also leads you to other places where you can file a complaint. Or if you're interested in becoming commissioner, you could apply. Um, Julian or another commissioner yep. want to talk about um, specific cases and what happens when maybe someone who's uh, filed a complaint when their case is being deliberated. Someone else want to talk about that? Sure. So I, I, can, oh. I can answer that question. Um, early in the presentation, I want to talk about like our process, right? Actually, let me see my camera. 
when we talked about our process, that you're notified at various different stages. When you file your complaint, you should receive an intake letter um, with whatever address or um, contact information that you provided in your complaint form, notifying you that your complaint has been received. Um, when your case is coming forward for deliberation by the commission, um, two weeks ahead of time, you receive another letter with um, notifying you time, place, um, and time, place, and location of where that um, PCR meeting is. And if you would like to provide a, this uh, voluntary statement, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, so, like we we tr we do our best to try and reach people um, and not specifically complainants um, when they when their complaint case is coming for a review and keep them um, as informed as possible. Um, yeah, I, I um, as far as like the final letter that's kind of left to um, in, in in internal affairs, who sends out that final complaint notice once the complaint is closed. Um, so we, we that's the only time in which we don't send out that letter. But um, for at least the intake and when the complaint case for review, your complaint case is coming forward before review, those letters come directly from here, and you should receive those. Um, yeah, in the mail. And I, I just wanted to add quickly, um, Commissioner Nadimi put that link in the chat, and thank you for doing that. But I also put Hero's direct link in the chat because it is as simple as singpaul.gov forward slash hero. And but when you enter it, it goes to the very long, drawn out, uh, you know, spelled out letter by letter address. And so a lot of people don't even know that just by entering singpaul.gov forward slash hero, it will take you to the um, hero website. So I did wanted to, to note that for everyone here. Thank you. Yeah, and if I want to highlight one positive thing that came out of um, the COVID-19 accommodations too, in that the public portion of our meeting is now streamed via Microsoft Teams. And so if you are interested in attending the public portions of our meetings, you can do so uh, virtually just as we're doing now. It's via Microsoft Teams, so you've already got the, got the software set up even. Um, and uh, there was also a question regarding accessibility. So our in-person meetings are held um, at different locations throughout the city, typically different recreation centers. Um, and that is one of our ways of getting in touch with the community and being more accessible. All of our meetings are held in places that are handicap accessible. And we at the PCR do also work pretty closely with the City of St. Paul's um, accessibility coordinator, uh, TJ Middlebrook. And so if, for example, an individual is coming in to give some testimony and they would like an interpreter, whether that be a language other than English or an interpreter for deaf of hard of hearing, the coordinator is able to work with us on that to ensure that um, that we're able to communicate clearly and that everyone that comes to our meetings is respected entirely so um it looks you, like just, it I, looks like I, we are ready to move to the next set i believe uh director butler will be introducing mayor carter uh just before we move on are, are there any final questions from anybody in the community or um anybody in the media uh before we move on to uh director butler nope all right uh, Director Butler, all you. Thank you, Chair Grundy. Good evening once again, everyone. It is my um, privilege to be able to introduce his honor, um, Mayor Melvin Carter, who is joining us tonight, and we are very grateful that he was able to fit us into his um, very packed schedule. So please join me in welcoming Mayor Carter. I will note that we at HERO, we feel very fortunate to have Mayor Carter as the head of the St. Paul administration right now. He definitely wholeheartedly believes in the work, mission, and values of HERO across all divisions. Um, so much so, I would note that prior to him becoming our mayor, when he was still a St. Paul City Council member, he was involved in the creation of HERO as we now know it today. So because of that, once again, the department and the work that we do is very important to him and is close to his heart. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Your Honor. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate uh, you, Director Butler. I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to kind of share this time with you. Uh, certainly, the Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity is near and dear to my heart. 
Uh, that started before I came to the city council. It's actually one of the reasons I came to the city council and one of the reasons why uh, I spent that first, I think, couple of years on the city council uh, in that process with then Mayor Coleman and uh, then city attorney John Choi uh, to help lead the creation of this, uh, or this, this department as an expansion of what was previously just a Department of Human Rights and did not include the explicit equal economic opportunity function. Uh, I often share with our staff in HERO uh, that you can tell our value, our city's value for this department, because when we do big things in our community, uh, when we uh, establish earn sick and safe time, uh, when we raise the minimum wage, uh, when we reimagine uh, public safety and the relationship between our officers and our community members. So often when we do very important like value-based things, uh, the administration and enforcement of that work uh, comes into, ends up falling into the Department of Human Rights and Equal Economic Opportunity. Uh, you are a living, breathing example of that. Uh, we, as you know, several years ago, uh, made the determination that uh, civilian oversight boards uh, needed to be 100% comprised of civilians. Uh, this is an example of the ways in which St. Paul was focused on accountability, was focused on uh, rethinking the trusting relationship that we know must exist between our officers, between our police department and our community members uh, long before George Floyd was ever killed. And I will tell you, uh, in the past 15 months or so, uh, I have people who ask me, press, community members and the like, uh, who ask me all the time, what are you going to do now that this has happened? What are you going to do different? And what I tell them is uh, that St. Paul is going to continue on the path uh, that we were on, that we've been on for the past several years. And notably, I must note uh, that that work predates uh, my work in office. I'd like to say I was a part of a, a lot of the beginnings of a lot of that work as a city council member, but I certainly pick up on the work of, uh, of uh, then Mayor Coleman. I pick up on the work of a whole host of the last handful of police chiefs in St. Paul, uh, including Chief, our current chief, Chief Todd Axtell, uh, who's been focused on many of these things. Uh, that's why in our administration, uh, we've revised our use of force policies. That's why we've completely rewritten the kind of use of the, the uh, rules that govern uh, canine deployment. That's why we've expanded our community uh, engagement division in the police department. And that's why we continue to support uh, the PCR this as a critical piece of all of this to say, uh, you know, I believe the PCR to me uh, is an indication that we can say we believe in accountability so much. We believe in transparency so much. And the truth is we believe in our police department so much uh, that we are confident turning on the lights. Uh, we are confident with uh, this incredibly high standard of transparency that we've met through this work. Uh, you know that we are expand, we're continuing to expand on that work right now. And a key piece of that is the community first public safety framework that we have been building out with community members over the past several years. That safety framework includes having officers who uh, value our community, who have uh, the, 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 the rapport, who have the resources, who have uh, the training, the tools, and the trust that they need to do their job well. Uh, it also uh, includes, as we build it out, uh, a set of what we think of as alternative and co-responders uh, who can help us meet the needs of the large number of people who call 911, not because there's some incident of crime or violence or you know emergency happening in our community, but because they have some legitimate community level concern or because someone's in crisis. I wanna thank your chair, uh, Sierra Cumberland for serving on that commission. Uh, we promised, uh, I think, a, a large volume of work in a short period of time. Uh, and I think, we, what do you think, Sierra? I think we uh, we made good on that promise. Uh, and But the, the deal was that it'll be one of the most important things uh, that happens in this city in a generation. And the recommendations that that commission brought us back, a 48-member commission, uh, that included everyone uh, from law enforcement uh, to activists to business leaders to uh, community nonprofit leaders uh, in our community working alongside city staff. I believe the type of conversation uh, that may be possible only in St. Paul, while other communities are stuck kind of in back and forth, we're able to bring people to the table and really have a conversation and build what I think is a very thoughtful path 
uh, Sierra, as I hope that you've been able to see, uh, that commission was under the leadership of Akua Ellis, who was my aide when I was on the city council, uh, and John Marshall, who I met actually when he was uh, former council member Pat Harris's aide. Uh, they both uh, led that work forward. And as it has come forward, it has been very well received by our city council, very well received by press, by community members, very well received by uh, law enforcement, I think very well received by advocates and some of everyone in between. And that's because of the deep level of thinking that went into that. So we're building out this community first public safety framework that includes our officers, that includes these alternative co-responders, but also includes proactive investments. One of the things I assume you've heard me say before is a public safety framework that centers uh, completely around what happens after something terrible happens is woefully insufficient. So it also has to include those proactive investments and what I, what I always think of as our highest potential neighbors and our highest potential neighborhoods in our community. Uh, that's enormous. And I think it's a big frame that we're building. I wanna tell you, as I tell everyone, uh, one of the things that I've learned is almost nothing works in our community in the same way it works on my whiteboard. When we get into doing something and we get into executing and implementing it, we find that we learn things as we try to implement and it has to grow uh, together. And so we'll continue to look to uh, that commission. Uh, we'll continue to look to you. We'll continue to look to community members. Uh, and what uh, I hope to show you as we move into our budget uh, phase uh, for both our city budget for 2022 and for how we invest the uh, $166 million we have coming from the federal government uh, by way of American Rescue Plan dollars, that you'll see that uh, we brought that 48 member commission together uh, and with the full intent uh, to move swiftly uh, and intentionally to implement uh, the recommendations uh, that came that come out of that work. So uh, there's there's some exciting news to come in, in the coming days about that work uh, that I'm excited to, to, to continue to share uh, how we're moving that work forward uh, in partnership with partners around the country as well. Uh, all that to say, uh, this is the work that we're doing. This is the work that you're leading. As you know, the ability for us to say, uh, our officers partner with our civilians, that when we give our officers that type of uh, uh, influence, that type of power, uh, that type of authority to move into our community, that they are doing it within the license that we give them as community. That's what civilian policing is in the first place. My father's a 28 year retired St. Paul police officer. And what he always says is uh, about the phrase community policing is that it's repetitive that if it's not community, it's not policing in the first place. So you are literally bringing the community into policing as this body. That's why this body is so critical, so important uh, to the, the, the to gluing together the mesh of all of the things that we just discussed. When I, the first thing I said about this kind of critical community first public safety framework, which I think may be the most important thing that we're doing as a city right now, the first thing I said was having officers who have uh, the, the, the respect, uh, who have the resources, uh, who have the capacity, the training, the tools, and the trust to do their jobs well. And when our community members know that there's accountability, when our community members know that there's transparency, when our community members know that there's the public reports that you create, that helps to create an investment in trust. So thank you for what you're doing for public safety. Thank you for what you're doing for our community members. Thank you what you're doing for thank you for what you're doing for our police department. And let me tell you, I get the calls. I hear from the White House. I hear from uh, other cities around the country. I hear from nonprofit organizations and foundations uh, in serving our city well and serving our police department well. You are providing leadership for our entire country as well. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I'm just very pleased to have the PCR uh, and all the commissioners at the table as partners in our work. I know that I say that not only on behalf of myself, but on behalf of our city council members, I see council member Naker uh, in, the, uh, in, in the Zoom call, in the Teams call with us. Uh, I know I say that on behalf of our entire community. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mayor Carter. Mayor Carter, we really do appreciate you uh, joining us once again, uh, unfitting us into your um, schedule this evening. And uh, thank you. And as Mayor Carter just indicated, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that Council Member Rebecca Naker is on the call with us. Thank you very much for joining us, Council Member. Before I wrap up, and I know we only have two minutes left in our scheduled time, but Council Member, I wanted to ask if there was anything you wanted to add today, and not to put you on the spot, um, but just in case. 
And never, <clears throat> I never mind being put on the spot. Thank you so much for um, inviting me tonight. Mayor, thank you so much for your powerful words. It's always inspiring to hear you. Um, I get more excited about the work that we're doing together every time I hear you speak. I really just wanted to say thank you. I, I started off in um, my time in public service serving on the Planning Commission um, and on my local district council board. And so I know what it's like to have to um, and to get to take hours out of your out of your nights, out of your work days, um, to give freely of your time to, to making our community better. And it does not go unnoticed. Um, I just, I, from the bottom of my heart, I'm so grateful to you for, for taking the time to do this important service. So thank you. Thank you, council member. And I, we will be adding with a public service announcement from Alicia Tao with the HERO department. But before I do that, I just wanted to wrap up and say thank you very much to everyone for joining us for this year's annual summit. We truly do appreciate your attendance and we depend on it to make sure that things are working for you guys as the community as they should be. Um, as we noted before, please feel more than free to visit our site to um, become informed of any and all upcoming PC ARC events and HERO events in general. And I put it in the chat, but thank you, Coordinator Roby, for putting it up, up on the screen. There are the two direct uh, website addresses for both the HERO department and PC ARC itself. We, I do want to note that our next major upcoming event will be held on September 12th is the date, and that will be our, excuse me, September 14th. Um, yeah, and that will be our annual PCR LEP summit, which is the Limited English Proficiency Summit, uh, which will be dealing with working with our various community members whose first language may not be English. This will be our first in-person event. We are happy to announce it will be held at um, Marydale Park, located at 542 Maryland Avenue West in St. Paul. Of course, we will be sending out more information as it becomes known, but we just want to put that on your uh, on your calendars for today, because of course we would love to see you all out there, especially since it will be an in-person event. We will have a DJ on hand to make sure that it is a great time. Um, and it will be a family friendly, family friendly event, excuse me. So please feel free to bring out your family. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Tao with our Labor Standards Division with the Department of Hero. Thank you, Ms. Tao. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to take too much of your time. I'm just going to show you one quick um, slide. If I can find it here. Let me just scroll to it. Um, wanted to just share with you about minimum wage. We do have an increase coming as of July 1st of this year. And um, here we go. And. Uh, Sorry, it's kind of small. So what I'll do is I'll drop the link into the chat box and wanted to just share that uh, for the macro businesses, if it's 10,000 um, or more employees, the rate will be the same of 1250. But large business, small business, and micro business, uh, the rate will go up slightly. So if you have any questions in regards to what their rate is, feel free to give me a call. Um, I'll drop my contact information in the box as well. But wanted to share with you that the minimum wage increase is happening on July 1st of 2021, and it will be our first increase for the city of St. Paul, and it will be um, just a really great thing as well. And I understand there are some challenges. I do get the phone calls and also the emails of, you know, the frustration of uh, the rates going up, but just the complexity and difficulty of everyone's financial situation. And so I, I do want to acknowledge that and don't want to dismiss that at all. But I wanted to let you know that if you have any questions or if anyone comes to you about what's the current rate as of July 1st, feel free to just say uh, contact the hero department and then they will put you in contact with me. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alicia.
And so I believe that should conclude our um, summit. Thank you all for attending. And um, as Deputy uh, Interim Director mentioned, um, please feel free to reach out if you guys have any additional questions. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Bye.